Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Monday, August 22nd of 2016, a City Council meeting. At this time, I will call the meeting to order, and we will do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Does it stand or stands? It stands. <laughs> okay, Shelley, if you'd like to do a roll call for us. Sure can. Albertson? Here. Bueller? Here. Danforth? Absent. Manti? Absent. Riefenberger? Absent. Roby? Here. Solom? Here. Thorson? Here. Tupper? Here. Bill Hauer? Here. Thank you. Okay, and uh, on number one here, approval of the agenda. I would like to pull number two off of the agenda, so if I could get a uh, motion and a second on that. So moved. Motion by Bruce, second by Glenn. Any questions? Any changes? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. I would say, Shelley, I think Mike will be here closer to 6 o'clock. He had uh, something that was going on. Okay, when he does come, can you just say let the record show that Alderman Danforth has arrived? Right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have number one out of the way. Number two has been pulled. Number three, presentation, review, and public input on proposed capital improvement plan. The proposed CIP book can be found on the city's website. And uh, a hard copy is also available for viewing in the finance office. So, Shelly, I'll just uh, turn this over to you. Thank you. Um, hopefully everybody's had a chance to review the uh, long-term CIP book. Um, this, as you can see, it doesn't include 2017. Uh, we did go through those public hearing meetings and we did talk about the capital for 2017 with the rest of the budget, so uh, we won't be talking about any of that. Also, you'll kind of notice that there really isn't a specific order because um, there's a lot of departments that um, they're very kind of straightforward um, routine and so I didn't feel the need to go through a department by department so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go through the book as presented there's two different um, areas in this book the first part is the um, equipment replacement plan and that's a little bit different than the capital and we separated them for one as you kind of noticed in the 2017 budget uh, this this equipment replacement plan is really a tool that is used uh, we we put in here the equipment that needs to be replaced in the next five years as a long term kind of as a placeholder based on their useful life and then as each year comes they review that list and if it's in good working order they go ahead and push it back out if something becomes problematic they'll they'll move it around um, so it, it's it's not something that is etched in stone it's just kind of for you guys to see how much equipment is out there kind of what the estimated cost is and then also for the mayor and the department has to use as a tool to be able to coordinate some of that and, and to pass some of that equipment around which again you guys kind of saw in 2017 so I'm just I'm going to go and open up to the council if you have any questions on any of the equipment replacement plan, any department, the department heads are here. Um, just kind of say what page you're on, what department you're asking the question on so that the department head knows to come up to the podium and answer those questions. If you have any general comments, um, anything for the mayor or I, you can ask them at any time, but I'll just I'll open it up and we'll talk about it as long as you want to, and then we'll go on to the capital projects. One of the things, if I may, uh, Shelley, I'd like to just draw attention to page three, right in the very beginning, with the street department. We moved a tractor, a $62,000 tractor, from 2017 to 2018. Um, this probably isn't going to happen even in 2018. We were just recently contacted by Titans. Uh, Rob, I don't know if you want to just touch base on that a little bit, but they gave us a tractor that we can use. They need 150 hours on it and we can use this tractor for a dollar. Yeah, actually with the mayor saying there, we just uh, stumbled across that program here last week and actually this afternoon we did pick up one of the new tractors. Um, 
we can put 150 hours on it and then we have to turn it back into them we just cover the insurance on that and if we pop a tire or something like that we have to replace that but um, it is an option we can do there and the only 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 thing I'm not certain about there is if uh, once we turn that tractor in is if they always have another one available I think what I understand is that if, if there isn't one available you can have one of burgers perfect <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you're on the same program, are you not? And it works extremely well, if I'm not mistaken, for a dollar. Uh, Rob, they told me that you could put any kind of equipment on it if you want to put a little loader on or if you want to put a, a mower on the side. So I thought that was uh, very, very nice of them to do this. Yep. Yeah, it's a great opportunity. It saves right. us a lot of, lot of money on purchasing a new one. So, Rob, how many hours would you typically put on a tractor in, how, in a month or six months? Or we would, <laughs> we'd go through a few tractors a summer. That's why I say if they, we turn that in at 150 hours, we would need to have something, you know, as a backup for that or another one coming in. And from what I understand, I mean that. That shouldn't be too problematic, and actually, Mike might know better than than I do because they do that program. Yeah. The the tractors, um, you guys do that every year, don't yeah. you? Yeah. And we just ensure that <coughs> we put them on our insurance, use them like a demonstrator, uh, and uh, if the rate broken, we get the big uh, heavy duty tractors, four wheel drive. Mm -hmm. Basically, no problem. Right, right. Yeah, these tractors are uh, they're definitely big enough. <laughs> So, right. And uh, let the record show that uh, Bill Riefenberger showed up for the uh, the meeting tonight. Welcome, Bill. Or should I call you Glenn? <laughs> Let's stick with Bill. Okay. Okay. So I I just wanted to touch base on that one on that particular item. So, say, Rob, as, as long as you're there, I got a question on page 19 and 20. A, a couple a couple questions actually. Okay. Um, Refresh me. Uh, we have a sweeper budget in 2019. We've also got one coming in 2017 too, don't we? Yeah, 17. Okay. Yeah. And then on both 19 and 20, there is a motor motor grader, one for snow removal, one for street department. I mean, we are talking two separate graders or two different graders here. Right. Just a matter of one department versus the other. <laughs> yeah. The we we have put. Uh, let's see here. Let me take a look here. We have one under under street and then we do have under snow in 2022 um because we do use them not just for you know snow we do use them in the summer for the alleys and, and gravel streets so <coughs> we generally try to run i mean there's some there's some time where these things sit in the summer but we do run two of them back and forth occasionally we'll fire up a, another one and run it for part of a week you know or a week at a time so right and one of the things I think you guys will will see when you take a look at the uh, 18 19 20 21 22 on on both schedules whether it be snow or whether it be the street department we try to keep that uh, spending dollars kind of in the same range so that we don't have any huge surprises come up you know where you've got five hundred thousand or six hundred thousand dollars right. we're looking at kind of an average of of three hundred to three fifty and in that 280 to 300,000 over the snow side. Right. We've tried hard to balance that out each year, so it's it's really not a shock any given year. You pretty much can expect 300,000 or so uh, out of our street budget, and what do we got? About 200 plus out of our snow budget each year. So. Any other questions for Rob while he's up there? In other departments, other questions that you have? Um, I've got a, a couple of questions for, for Doug, if you wouldn't mind. Can you say what page you're on? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it'd be um, I think we will. Yeah. 16 and 17. You know, we noticed Doug kind of crawling down behind that chair. He, <laughs> he thought he could hide from it. I don't know. <laughs> it didn't work. Did um, it? <laughs> on page Welcome, Doug. On page 16, Doug, the, um, in 2019, we got 35000 budgeted for JAWS rescue equipment. Uh, I mean, are, are we okay until then? I mean, is this a replacement or is this a, something new? Or, I mean, I, my, ultimately the question of are we okay putting it off until 2019? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, 
what we had looked at doing is uh, we're we're looking at uh, putting on uh, one on our new pumper that's coming in 2018, and uh, so we kind of maneuvered around a little bit to see if we should get that earlier, like uh, uh, 2017, and uh, see where our dollars all were laying out and stuff. So that that was moved. Uh, uh, our truck should come in around that fall of summer, late summer, early fall of 2018. We're hoping uh, upon approval, uh, and uh, so. Uh, the worst case scenario would be is uh, if, if this did stay in 19, uh, we'd be uh, about three, four months uh, without it being a, uh, uh, on, the, on the new truck. So, uh, If so. you want to explain a little bit what this new uh, Jaws of Life is versus the old one. Oh, yeah. How they, I mean, because it is a different piece of equipment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, in, uh, basically, we most of our trucks have hydraulic engines. So it's gas engines running hydraulics that uh, hooks up to all these hoses, and uh, uh, so anytime you have have to need uh, uh, a need for that equipment, you have to fire up the engine. Uh, sometimes, if it's off in the distance, you'll have to drag the whole engine down into the into the ditch because you only got so many feet of hose. Uh, that's the old systems. The new one are all battery operated now. So. So basically, you have a spare battery, and it's the same pressures and powers and everything. So, uh, very much more portable and uh, easier to to bring into a to a field or up into a building. You just grab on it and go, and it's ready to hit the trigger. So it's a lot a lot faster, and uh, it also has backups on it too. If if your your battery dies on you, which uh, lasts a lot of hours, uh, you can plug it into a regular 110 outlet on the generator truck. So. They're, uh, they're pretty neat. Uh, it'll be our first one uh, uh, of this battery type. So, Doug, on page 17, there's a, it says an ambulance is going to be 212,019, and another one is 180. Is that, is what would be the difference? Yeah, in? that that's a good question. Uh, uh, basically, the, the type ones, uh, we rotate some type one uh, rigs, which are the big four-wheel drive pickup box, the heavy duty ones. We got two of those and three type threes. I believe we'll stay on that course and the type threes are a little less money. And uh, so what, what we're doing is uh, one may be a type three, the one that's less money is the type three, which is a, uh, the van, the van uh, chassis with the, the square box. So. You, That's the reason for the difference in price. Did we use not talk about a different type of ambulance, though, that you weren't going to go with the big box? Uh, maybe take a look at a lot of the transfers and have more of an ambulance that's <coughs> that's a transfer unit. Is that not less dollars than what you were showing on the other? Yeah, so as we as we look at um, uh, for in-town response, these type ones are working well to, for four-wheel drives and stuff, but going down the road, they're a little heavier and a little less gas mileage. So. Currently, we have the Type Threes, and we're always looking at what are some of our other options. Uh, they make a smaller um, uh, type uh, sprinter type ambulance that's just built for transfers. It could be used in an emergency. Uh, it may not. Uh, uh, the equipment's a little tighter, and the working uh, conditions are a little tighter. But we don't use it in town that much for emergencies. It would be just dedicated to a transfer rig. They're coming in uh, quite a bit cheaper. Uh, they're probably about a hundred thousand uh, dollar rig. Uh, you, we'd probably just dedicate it for transfers. Uh, we we do have a few concerns that we have to research a little more to make sure it's going to work for us before we buy one. Maybe try one going down the road, but uh, we're not sure how to do in the high winds going through the the hills, going to Sioux Falls and stuff over them, over those high areas. So we want to we want to check on that before. But uh, other than that, it uh, it's it seems like it it could be a possibility. So the first one you're placing is a 2000 or not? There's a 2009, a 2000, and a 2010. Okay. Um, actually, what we're doing now is uh, we're re we're moving ahead of the schedule uh, on one of our rigs. So we what we're doing we have an old 2000. Uh, that'll be our next one that we do have to replace. It's a, been a very good solid Type 3 ambulance. That'll be the, the not the one in 17, but the one in 19 will be a, a replacement of the 2000. It's just getting to the point where we have to get rid of that one. So then then there's, a, at that time, we could look at some, some options of a, of a new Type 3 or a Sprinter or something. That, that particular one would not be able to be remounted. It's a little lesser uh, quality box, if you will. Um, so we'll probably look at a new regular, a sprinter, or a type three, 
And then when we hit 2021, 20, depending on if these remounts work, we'll probably do a remount of another uh, of another type three at that time. I guess I've got a similar question. Uh, so, so we're not replacing, the, the way it's presented in the book on page 17, it almost looks like we're replacing three units with two, but that's not necessarily No, the that, case. that would be, um, the, the first one is probably getting replaced in 2017, and it just didn't get taken off of the long term, so. Yes, that's what it, that's what it is. The 2010 will be uh, uh, looked at as being a remount. So, Doug, the ambulance in 2019, that is a, that just has to be totally replaced. It's just shot. Is that what you're saying there? Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, the box itself isn't a, as heavy a gauge metal, and uh, that's what's nice about some of the rigs we've been buying. We, we can remount them now because the boxes and the doors and everything are really heavy duty. That one there is a 20-year-old box, and, and that was a, a cheaper-made box. It's sitting on a very good chassis. So it probably wouldn't be feasible to look at a remount by the time you got done with, with that older box. Uh, and, and the lighter duty box is probably the key. So. And then, Doug, the, the power cots that we're budgeting, I'm assuming that those, t those relate then to the units that we're getting in 19 and 21. Is that correct? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, we we basically taken the life cycles of, of our power cots and stuff and tried to, to uh, rotate them. They're kind of a new product, so we are unsure of the uh, the expected life cycle yet so i guess as as we move forward uh, we'll see what condition and shape and maintenance problems we're having with those and uh, um, go from there didn't we get some grants for the, some of those original ones yeah i think i think we've just about got a a reduced cost uh grant from the from the insurance company on most of them and and that's a that's a percentage uh, whether that's going to be there in the future uh, is yet to be determined is there any projected life cycle of them or yes there is and and we got that from the uh, recommendations from the manufacturers which which kind of places them into the years that uh, uh, we have and I and um, I believe it was a 10-year a, a cycle could you also um, maybe touch on page 55 where you've also got your long-term capital, and, and you're looking at uh, replacing your main fire station roof. If you could touch on that for us. No? Not yet. Don't want to do that? Not yet. No, I we're just going to... we had him up here. Yeah, we'll bring him back up. Yeah. I was going to get you done. You get the heck out of here. <laughs> Sorry. You got to got to hang I around. I appreciate that. <laughs> I tried, Doug. Any other equipment questions for Doug? Okay. Does anybody else have any other equipment questions for any other departments? I had one for Jay. Can you say what page you're looking at or what department? Page 36. Just wanted to ask about the turf replacement at the uh, uh, field house. That, I know that's getting a lot of use. And there's, there's such a varying degree of quality and of turf and padding. And there's some that just basically gets outdoor carpeting, you know, and they call it turf. But what just what's the plan there? It's, that's scheduled for 21. It's out there a little ways, but that's just it with the uh, with the field house getting so much use all the time that we just figured that it would be good to uh, probably replace that turf. Uh, you know, we do roll it up uh, once a year. It gets water on it every once in a while when it rains like we had the six inches last week. So we thought it would just be time to replace it. And what kind of turf is that? Are you can replace it with. Do you know yet? You know, I don't know. I know that uh, what they were talking about in the last year, some of the rubber tire fragments that were causing injuries. To, uh, we do not have that kind of turf, but we'd have to research what is the best at the time. Does anybody else have any other park and rec questions on equipment for Jay while he's up here? Anybody? Okay, I didn't want to make um, it. it I just want to ask about the uh, old ice, the, the current ice arena. Uh, are there is there some information further in that we can talk about? We have to wait and have Jay come back up for that as well. Right. Okay. Yep. the The capital part, we'll just go through those one at a time and then bring them up. Yep. Okay. Does anybody else have any other equipment? Uh, I've got a question for I think Todd. For for Todd, if you we got just a minute. Oh, page 29. 
and I guess it would relate to the capital side of it is too when we get to it. The, the, the federal and state grants that we've got for the funding sources, are, are those assured? I mean, do we know we're going to get those when the time comes? No. No, they're not. Uh, we go through this, I go through the same process with the federal government every year as well. Uh, we usually have a meeting in, in April or May at the state airports conference. And then in the fall, we also talk about this up in North Dakota in Bismarck. And so we have two meetings to discuss uh, a five-year plan uh, for every area. They have every airport, but uh, for Watertown, especially here, we go through two meetings a year. Uh, we verify funding uh, currently, right now. We're verifying funding for next year. So it's usually a year out. Uh, they'll do funding in July, August uh, for the next year. Now that isn't to say you're going to go out and buy this um, big snowblower without the assurance that you're going to have the backing behind you, right? We can't do that. Exactly. <laughs> they have to have funding to, to right. purchase something. Right. Because Shelly would be all over it, you know that. You, you don't think I can sneak that through? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks. I think what I'd like to see, Shelley, is just uh, each and every one of them come up and we'll go through those early pages. Uh, even if there's no question, at least let them come forward and, and say just a couple words. That's what we switched okay. to, Shelley, a few years back. Okay, well. Know, I know. Okay, so here's, I, I guess my question is on, on, on the equipment replacement, if there's any specific questions I just like them to be asked because uh, you know it's something that I don't want to focus on. I'd rather focus on the capital projects right. because I think that's the part of the long-term CIP that that it is. needs to be planned um, versus just kind of place markers for different equipment. So, um, if anybody has any specific you know, I'm not, issues, I'm not so sure if everybody's had an opportunity to look at everything on here. I don't. Are you guys comfortable with doing this? If you don't have any questions, to move on to. Uh, to the capital projects. You okay with that, everybody? I think we're okay. Okay. You okay? I'm okay. Uh, yeah. Some people yep. say I'm not okay, but yeah, because because okay. the equipment will the equipment will change every every year right. uh, depending on what needs to be replaced, what doesn't, what funding we have available, what we don't. Um, but the capital is really kind of where you really need to do some planning and and where it takes some significant dollars and placing those ones. We're going to go through one one at a time and bring them up and look through them. Right, and most of these here, we, we understand that they're going to need these products next year. It gives us a good handle on how to uh, start that budget right. process. Right, and then if there's any questions at, at all before you guys adopt this, ask and we can talk about it at a work session. We can, we can bring anything up before we adopt it. So if there aren't any other questions, then we can move to the Shall long. Shall yep. uh, not, a, not a question, just a comment. Mm -hmm. Just on page six, I think it might be worth noting, when we look at the total for the five years and realizing that this is not a, a budget as such, uh, we're just under 14 million. I went back and looked a year ago that the same the, for, for 17 through 21, it was just under 13 million. So just, a, just an observation. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, the, the long-term capital plan starts on page 46. And we go through kind of the same thing where, where you get a synopsis of, of any of the changes that were made from the original request once the mayor uh, met with all of the departments. And then kind of uh, where the funding's coming from, what some of those projects are, what the total is for the five years. And so the, really the first department that has any type of a capital is the IT. And that starts on page 51. <coughs> so if anybody, Spencer, is here, um, basically, um, and the mayor might want to talk about this too, or, or Spencer, what's on here is the fiber optic infrastructure that was put in place uh, a few years ago to, to try to get the city um, connected uh, as, as one central unit um, that might be changing. Um, so if Spencer, you want to just, just kind of gloss over it because they'll get a blow by blow yeah. when we get I farther think, into I think this. it is going to change, Spence, so keep it down so I can understand what you're saying. When you 
when you say all this IT stuff. It'll be kind of fun. We're trying to get a centralized network, and there's different ways of going about that. Um, we can either work with a partner and try to get some some lines, or we got to dig them ourselves. This budget was uh, intended for a number of things. It was for the actual digging of the trench and the fiber laying, as well as the equipment on the side on each side that is required to make that fiber work. Um, we we don't know exactly where that's going to head next year, so uh, my recommendation would be to continue and hopefully we don't have to use it. Well, I got to think that what, what we're going to see, Spence, is we're going to see uh, the entire city at some particular time in the very near future all com almost completely hooked up to fiber optics, and I think you're dealing with that right now with yeah. uh, with companies. Yep. So I, I think if you could just kind of follow through a little bit more on that, I think okay. they need that. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know how high you wanted that. Um, yeah, just yeah. Uh, I, I think they they would like to know that. I think it's it's important for them to understand what we're going to see in the next year, two years, three years. Well, what we're looking at is like having a centralized internet connection, and basically we'll work with a mixture of the fiber that we've already put in the ground, and also work with an ISP to to get that connection going. So basically what will happen is you can imagine the street department, the, any department will actually be able to go out City Hall's internet connection. Uh, there's a couple advantages of that is now when we look at our server budgets, we have we buy bigger servers here and we buy less of them. So that, and, and our backups are better. Everything's centralized and um, I, I guess I don't know how much more to go with that if there's any questions i got a question <clears throat> we're going to try something out there place with a radio tied in for the internet and phone and everything I and mean, our buildings are a mile apart but so tell, telling us if it's line of sight that there's not going to be a problem because uh i can't forget who is out to the airport one, one industrial one of the industrial uh places has got Ang not angus uh code or something or whatever. Anyway, they've gone from building to building. Instead of hardwiring, they're just doing a radio. Oh. Uh, and he says the bandwidth is, they can handle that with one server in one building. So I don't know that that's a long-term necessarily solution, but possibly uh, while you're working on that, it might be something from fire department to the police department to hear or something that, because that's fairly inexpensive as long as there's a line of sight that yeah, a guy we, can we hear. looked at some of that, like, especially like the street department. There's two buildings on the same campus, if you will. Um, and right now we're, we're paying for two internet connections on, for each of those. So, you know, we've looked at some of that. Uh, uh, most, most of the long range stuff does have to be line of sight or that I, for the speeds that we'd be looking at. Right. So uh, it gets a little difficult with mature trees, especially um, when, they're, when they're green. Right, but some of that might be as opposed to having to do wiring between closer absolutely. things. That'd be an option possibly. So yeah, Absolutely. No, no. Does that need to be run right here? <laughs> oh, there you go. Does that need to be run on on its own wiring? Because I mean, isn't there an EPN option or an option like we have a company in at Rapid City that goes through our firewall here in town? So um, you know, VPN is an option. Uh, we're currently using some uh, actually at the street department again to pick on him. Uh, he actually can VPN into uh, this network. At City Hall, so we're already doing some of that. Um, speeds are less generally. We're talking about um, uh, the max upload speed at the street department right now is probably five meg, and you're not going to get five meg. Uh, what we're looking at, if we partner with somebody, is 25 dedicated, and if we look at trenching in the fiber ourselves, we can actually get up to a gig, a thousand. Ooh. So the speed difference why do they need that much speed just out of curiosity you know they're not gaming right. <laughs> you know? but I, I i see where you're coming from but i think we can get it at a fair price where it um it makes sense versus paying for these the if you it requires hardware to have a vpn it requires some kind of firewall or router so it does require some some upfront capital expense um so 
you're kind of just weighing cost at that point and and cost and and speed um it also changes the game a little bit when we start talking about server and if we want to get that active directory to reach over that wire is i don't think we'd want to do that over a vpn we'd basically still have several s separate networks with the ability to tie in instead of them being a part of our network for like full on is that good <laughs> Spencer, is it at all possible to deal with the school and the school system here we, in terms of sharing fiber optics and that's uh, the school uses the same uh, they use the utilities is my understanding the same as what we do except the way that agreement works is um, this the uh, we pay to trench it we pay for the fiber we pay to end it and then we lease it from utilities when it's all said and done. All of those things have cost. Uh, it's, it's the exact same thing. Actually, our new community center, um, our fiber actually ends up going through the new middle school for that building. So it's the exact same s s setup. Um, it's not necessarily the sharing with the school. It's just how the school is doing it is the same as we're doing it. Um, and with that being said, is if, if there's a school near one of our buildings, all we have to do is get our fiber to that location, and then the utilities will tie it in. So that's kind of the, the way that it was going. Uh, and we're kind of steering away from that and seeing if we can't partner with an ISP and keep the price down. Excuse me. Can you elaborate a little more when you're saying partner with an ISP? So um, internet service provider is, uh, so uh, locally here we've got VAST and SDN and, and Midco, um, I guess data truck and RC. Uh, we're we're com currently in communications with VAST on some MPLS stuff. We've already got some MPLS uh, talks with SDN actually out at the um, uh, solid waste. Um, so we've got a couple lines in the water. So where would the cost difference be other than like utilities? I mean, would you still pay a, a basically, like you said, a rent on the fiber optics? Or? What we're looking at is, uh, you know, we we're shopping around for different uh, phone systems and if we can bundle some some things together, we might be able to get it at a very aggressive price. Does anybody else have any other questions for the IT for the technology, the fiber optic infrastructure? Okay. Thanks, Spence. We will move on. Page 52 is the city hall slash government buildings. The first line item is just a senior center improvements. That's something that um, gets budgeted every year. Uh, it is kind of, if, if the senior center is having issues, uh, they give us a call usually upstairs to the building services department. Um, Tim used to be the one that they would contact and, and um, I'm assuming uh, that his replacement will be that contact person. They'll go over and look at it, see what needs to be done call in some estimates uh, and make sure that it gets repaired. There's been some roof issues, um, some leaking. Um, every once in a while, um, they, in their kitchen, they were having some issues that we had to fix, sidewalk, um, soffit issues, um, drainage stuff. So um, it doesn't get used every year, but it's something that we always want to kind of have a little bit of a budget for because it is um, a city building and um, we are responsible for those repairs. So. That just kind of sits in there as a line item. I think last year we had to put some concrete on there for sidewalks. and We did, and know. then some of the drainage, some of yeah. the, um, it, it wasn't draining right or it was going back into the building and was causing some yeah. foundation issues. And I know so, this yeah. year there's some issues they've got on the block walls on the back side. They need to be kind of refilled in just a little bit. Yep. There's little things that need yep. to be done. And that's something that, um, and Tim and I talked about this before he ended up leaving, that, that it it may be at some point that as a council you would maybe want to hire somebody to just kind of go through and do a really good look through and give some recommendations. A building um, 
isn't the newest. Um, I think the city's kept pretty good care of it, and I think the, the people at the senior center are really good at telling us when there's an issue. Um, but sometimes you can kind of nickel your nickel and dime yourself um, a lot, and and it seems like in the last five years we've we've had more issues that we've had to fix. So it might not be such a bad thing to have somebody go through and just give us some recommendations of, of maybe just spending a little bit more money to take care of some of these things and then maybe we can go a few years without having to put three, four thousand dollars every time there's a leak or there's something that's not draining right or or whatever. And, and I'm not, as long as I've been here, I don't know that that's ever happened. But it, it might not be such a bad thing because we're not in there every single day and looking at what's going on we kind of get called if there's a problem so so basically that's 60 years old or better oh yeah uh, so the old national tea grocery store yeah. one day I, I don't know it's got to be at least uh, uh, I, you know I, I remember that as national tea and at least 50 years old I know that it has to be okay the um, other line item is the administrative building, and that was um, something that we had put in a year ago. And I don't know, Mayor, if you want to say anything about that or... Yeah, the only thing we've done so far is uh, we have looked at different uh, areas in town that's possibility to, to uh, uh, go with the administration, administ administrative building. And at this particular time, we did do some testing over where the snow pile uh, goes because there was issues out there and that's Rob's little baby over there where he puts his snow and uh, we did have geotech come through and, and did numerous tests uh, Shane I haven't seen the last report maybe you can touch on the on the report on that property rather than us have, having to buy something if we could utilize something we have in the future it uh, would make sense okay I, I don't want to get into too many specifics about the report because that gets highly technical. And that's okay. Just we lose okay track. Not. So basically the, the testing that was done is to verify whether the site could be built on successfully and not redisturb contaminated soils which are located uh, underneath that area. And generally speaking, we believe that we can accomplish building a building and a parking lot and all that without major impacts to the environment that was impacted by a previous um, operation in the adjacent property. But uh, there is one thing that we need to look at a little bit is drainage there. There is no storm sewer in that site. And, and so we'll continue to evaluate and look at those kind of issues. But And then I did have a, so a separate soils um, thing done to assist the building of a new roadway through there too. Right, and actually the, uh, the, D the DENR who was in our office, you know, at, with Geotech along with yourself and, and, and me, we um, were very encouraged by, I'm trying to think of her name, um, anyhow, she would like to see us so that we do not use that space anymore for, for snow storage, only because of things go down and then they spread out and, and they want to make sure that there's no spreading underground that uh, could affect anything. Yeah, yeah. She's worried about the melting snow and r rain that runs into that site, pushing the aquifer underneath the site uh, out of its current location and contributing to the spread of the contaminants that are below ground. So, she would like to see us repurpose that site. Is this figure the the two and a half million dollars in eighteen? Is that uh, architect estimate? Is that where we got those figures? And then for nineteen as well? Yeah, actually, we've had numerous discussion with different architects, and uh, for a building of, of the size that we're looking at, we currently have about twenty two thousand square feet here of three floors. As you know, two of the floors can be used; one of the floors is not. Um, so we're looking at the same square footage 22 to 24,000 square feet. This is the dollars that they're initially telling us is what it would cost to build that uh, that size of a building. It would be one level. It would uh, about that 20, 22, 23, 24,000 square feet. What, what's the rationale? Why, why, I mean, I realize that we're very preliminary in this, but why, why do we have the split between 2018 and 2019? 
I think you guys did that last year to us. We actually had uh, uh, requested 2.5 in Glen. I believe you asked to uh, to put in the additional, and we thought that it's not going to carry through and be done in 18. It would probably finish off in 19. So we would put some of those dollars into that. <laughs> A guy forgets, you know, you go through all that stuff and I appreciate that, uh, the question though. Any other questions on that? Okay. We'll move on. Page 53 is the engineering department. And Shane is here if you have any questions. That's basically um, the yearly pictometry um, updates that they do. And if you want Shane to kind of explain that a little bit, he sure can, or why the numbers are different and who the players are. And if, you know, do you want, why don't you go ahead, Shane? Yeah, what, what is, uh, I mean, the big jump in 2020? Well, um, basically these numbers are a reflection forward of our current contract which was a two-phase contract and, and and so what happens is they package flight data in into the, the contracts we had a phase one which was done um, in 2014 uh, we're in phase two coming this coming spring in 2017 so we'll d get another flight that will update our imagery and then <clears throat> along with that we'll enter a new contract going forward after phase two. And so we've just taken those costs in phase one and two and mirrored them forward. <clears throat> it's likely that those numbers will increase some percentage, but at this point in time, we don't, we don't know. So these are just kind of keeping us current with our um, pictometry so that we don't fade too far in the past. We've already, uh, it seems like three years is not that long a time between images, but when you look at the image from 14 and now look at what we've done in the time since then, there's so many places that uh, don't reflect. Um, I mean, for instance, next spring, you're gonna see the new middle school. You're gonna see the rec center complete. You're gonna see, uh, you know, a new theater, Hobby Lobby. And, and that's just the ones that are, were on the horizon from 15 and 16. So. It, it's uh, something we got to keep pace with if we're going to use our GAS uh, correctly. Yep. <clears throat> Shane, how long is that contract run? How, what's the time period for that? Well, uh, you know, I wasn't around for the last contract, and so I'm assuming that the previous contract was from 14 through 17, and we'd probably do another three or four year contract after this one's finished. So, and then one thing, there aren't very many companies in this area that country that do this pictometry flights so we're kind of locked into a, a good partnership right now pictometry has been excellent for the city and actually you know um, sister cities all around this part of the country are all tied into pictometry and doing very well with it so and we can get ADI out there get Todd working on it and <laughs> get a camera out the window so Shane, that, that extra strap him to the wing. Ten or eleven. That's the year that they do the flight. Then, and so that's what you're trying to mirror is what was in the past for that. Well, that's why it jumps because that's the year that they actually right update right. The they they have more investment in the the flight years than they do the the rest. So, okay. Does anybody else have any questions on the engineering? I've got, I want to back us up for just a minute, and I apologize. I'm assuming that some of the IT needs that we're looking at uh, down the road obviously will be somewhat dependent upon what we end up doing with, as far as a new building, correct? And that's a, is that a fair statement? Well, Spencer can probably answer that better, but I think we're, we're looking for a solution that we could pick up and, and move um, because we have the same issue with the street department if we end up doing something different or if we would ever put up an, a new building or any additional, we would want something that's transportable to another location. Am yeah, I in Interesting enough, I think today's conversation was uh, GYP. So, so if something were to happen and we had a, a fire call, just grab your phone, take it with you, because you'll be able to plug it in at home and have your office there. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're pretty conscious about the... I think that was your acronym, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're conscious of, of the fact that buildings can move, and we're trying, to, we're trying to 
focus and make sure that the things that we invest in are, are movable. Any other questions? Otherwise, we will move on to page 54. And that starts the police department. So I'd like to touch base on that just a little bit, Shelley, because um, the Boys and Girls Club is, is working on their, their facility right now. That's going to be at least a two-year project. So there is a very good chance that this one in 18 could be more into 19. Um, but we, we put it in there as a placeholder it, right now. OK. For the, uh, for the indoor gun. Tim, range. do you want to come on up? Lee was not able to be here, and so he sent the second in command, Mr. Toomey. And so he can answer any of your questions. And, and for anybody out in the public watching, uh, the mayor was just referring to the indoor portion of the gun range. We've been talking about the outdoor portion and the indoor. And the reason the 1.5 went to 2018 is because it was kind of a decision that the outdoor portion was moving faster than the indoor could move. And um, so, yeah, it, it, it's a placeholder, but it can move once we start doing the 18 budget, kind of like it did in, in 17, kind of just depending on how things go and where the outdoor range is. And I don't know, did you have anything to add about that, Tim, for the indoor portion? I don't. Um, it's just an, it's a, still an ongoing process. Still a lot of meetings going on and planning and figuring out how that thing's going to look. So. Okay. Do you want to just take just a second? <coughs> um, on yours, there there's some um, carpet, vinyl, office furniture replacement. Do you just kind of want to go through the rationale? Um, you know, talk about the age of your building and kind of what what you're doing and how you're kind of sure. working that for some of your maintenance and replacement issues. Yep, we've been in uh, we've been blessed with that building since uh, 2011. So we're looking at an eight to ten year. Uh, future outlook, I guess, and the amount of people in and out of the building. It's wear and tear on the carpet and the vinyl. So we're just uh, looking forward and seeing what's going to come up. Right now, the carpet's looking pretty good and the vinyl's looking pretty good. And we, we have a full-time maintenance guy that takes really good care of it. So uh, we'll reevaluate it as it gets closer, but just kind of giving you a heads up. As, as far as the funding source, I'm assuming we're, we're hopeful that we'll be able to latch on to some other other funding rather than, I mean, right now he's got it plugged in as being coming from sales tax. Uh, is that, I mean, we're, we're hopeful that it's going to get partially paid for from other means. Is that the case? Are you talking about the gun range? Oh, yeah. Oh, um, that I'm not sure. Right now we don't have any intention of having any um, grant funding to that but right. I can't and, say and that we, we did is on the on the outdoor range we do have uh, agreements that we're, we're dealing with you know the game fish and parks and we're dealing with uh, county and uh, there's guard. just National Guard there's we numerous that. that are involved in that in fact I think the National Guard no, I'm sorry the game fish and parks are the one that are designing it for us on the outdoor side of it but on the indoor side uh, you really don't have as many options you you really need to go into um, the NRA, and I'm not so sure if you want to do that. But I think we need to have our options open, and we need to investigate that and see what what is available for us. One question on the indoor: we had some conversation a while back at one of our quarterly meetings on the PD or whatever about whether anything would be incorporated for archery or anything like that. With and it sounded like the gun range itself doesn't really work to use either or. Is there any? Currently, any planning to try to fit any of that into things or not? In the outdoor range, I know they're planning ahead for skeet and maybe archery and, and things like that. Just kind of selecting spots on the on the area where we're hoping to build. So One of the things, if I may, uh, Tim, is that the archery, the the game fishing parks is going to be building a new facility out south uh, of Pelican. They also have an archery range right now, and I believe they're looking at um, uh, expanding that archery range on the outside and possibly of some on the inside. So we need to be aware of what they're doing on that. Okay, well, you know, I've just, I've had people that are interested in the archery talk to me and want to know, you know, because apparently some of that was, is getting done over in the, the old auditorium, and that's not really probably the adequate space for them to do that. So I just was trying to keep it, that out in front, whether there's anybody. And it doesn't mean we got to do it, it just, you know, as long as maybe somebody's covering it. but. Uh, there's certainly a lot of excitement about the outdoor range, and I'm hearing a bunch about that. So, yeah, 
the conversations I've been in, Bill, on that, that because they have the, the uh, archery range out south and because there is a skeet range out north that, that are pretty adequate, both of them, that they're really focusing on the shooting range, the gun ra the rifle range, and then the, the handgun range as being the top two priorities. But, th then, but those are just outdoor as far as the archery. Yeah, but I, I think maybe there's uh, the, the last meeting. I didn't go to the last meeting, but the one before that, they were kind of skirting the archery range because we already have one, and so that really focus in on the long range rifle and then the indoor, the indoor handgun range. Yes. My, my understanding was, Bill, I think that um, the GFMP was, was looking at indoor archery out there also. Okay. And I think it's just good if people are aware that there's some conversation on that, and that, that's all I was looking for. Yep. And I think they brought that up at their last meeting, that, that as they design the building, that's kind of the trend in other game fish and park buildings is to have an indoor portion. Does anybody else have any other questions about the long-term <coughs> capital for the police? Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Page 55 is fire. So if Doug wants to come back up. And there's really only one, one thing for capital-wise, and that's the replacing the main fire station roof. So, Doug, if you just want to talk about that a little bit, and then you guys have any questions you can ask. Yes, thank you. Um, basically, the, the roof... Uh, at hand in 2018 is the the old truck room uh, that was built in the 60s that was left in place and we replaced the doors uh, I believe the building was uh, finished up and finalized in 2013 uh, to my knowledge the roof on the flat roof on the old truck room was somewhere around that 1999 range um, I remember it coming off warranty about three or four years before the new building was built so uh, we evaluated what uh, condition it was in at that time with uh, the previous mayor, and uh, that was an uh, alternative bid on, on our, when we built the new station. And uh, it was decided uh, by him, him and myself at that time to, to put that off and, uh, uh, to a later date and get the full use out of that roof. Um, so what we've done over the last five years is, is just kind of monitored it. Uh, we, we the number you have up there is uh, I believe is what we had off our our alternative bid uh, at the time of the the new building built and uh, uh, I think my next step on there is um, to maybe have it evaluated uh, by by a company and and just see what the condition of that roof is and uh, it's it's scheduled for 2018 and. Uh, we really haven't had too many problems with it. Uh, we had one leak uh, where it met the new taller truck room, but that was in the flashing off the, the truck room, so it really had nothing to do with that roof. We had other, one other small leak around uh, a furnace vent, uh, and, and, uh, but other than that, I uh, uh, haven't had too many problems. So we'll get that evaluated and, and make sure that price is accurate as we move forward into the next year and uh, see what, uh, what the evaluation comes in for the condition of that roof. Doug, a small suggestion might be to see what it would cost for a little bit of a pitch on that roof. You know, if it's a flat roof, they're historically just very, very difficult to maintain. But it doesn't take too much of a pitch before it's a lot easier. So they might want to look into that at the same time. Yeah, we can we can sure we can sure look into that as an option to see how that would look and and uh, get some designers in there to see if if they could make something. Uh, look good with some rafter systems and and possibly a like a metal roof or something that would really look uh, sharp in there and, and see how that compares to what the cost of a, a flat roof would be and if it could be done yeah we can do that any other questions for doug okay yeah. thanks doug next one page 56 is the street department <coughs> Rob, there's basically two items, as you can see on there. Um, Rob, if you want to kind of talk a little bit about the ventilation and 
and electric and what you're planning, which building, um, why, and then about the 2021? The, the ventilation that you see here, uh, this was in place in the long term before I got to the street department. And, and from what I understand, it was for updating the ventilation in the main shop. Uh, and then the electrical, we've already done some of that in the main shop. Um, and there is some electrical issues in, in the old DOT building where my office is. And basically this here, if we continue to to look at a new facility for 2021, the 55,000 will probably go away then. So um, that's where we're at on that, I guess. Any questions? Rob, is either the high school or Lake Area interested in that location? Um, from what I understand, I think the Lake Area at one point was. Now, I don't know uh, if they're still interested. Do you know, Mayor? Oh, I think they are. I think that we just haven't had any further discussions uh, at this time. Yeah. Do these numbers include anything for uh, a val re for sale value of current land? Um, it does not. Uh, we did have that appraised here, uh, what's it been, a year ago, and that does not show that, does not reflect that. Excuse me. What was the appraisal amount, you know? I, I believe it was around 500 and... I forget the exact number, but it was 500 and some odd thousand for the facility with the buildings. I think you meant like, it depends on who's listening. I think it was 5.7 million. I don't know. <laughs> That's what I thought I read. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions on <clears throat> the street department capital? And just as a reminder, too, on that 3.985 um, for 2021, that the way we came up with those numbers, I, I worked with uh, Travis Torgerson from Gray Construction, who had recently put up a new facility in Clear Lake at the time last year uh, when I got the numbers from him. Um, and we came up with a per square foot price. And then I did work with the director of equalization, too, to determine what land the going rate uh, was on land around town. So anyway, that's how we came up with that. It's initial numbers, and I guess as we draw closer, we're going to have to, you know, look closer at what it would take. So, uh, Let the record show that Mike Danforth um, is now at, uh, present at the council meeting. Welcome, Mike. To catch you up, Mike, there's a whole bunch of cookies there for you. And uh, we're on page 56 okay. of your capital. Anybody else have any other questions for the street department? <coughs> okay. We'll go to page 57, which is a street system improvements. And I would think between Shane and maybe Rob, um, anybody has any questions about any of the projects or any of the annual maintenance costs we're on page 57 Mike on the street system improvements I'll just kind of open it up and if you guys have questions go ahead and ask I would like to if I if I may I'm gonna just Rob right there in 2018 where we have the in Shane the mall uh, street reconstruction we put it there but frankly I don't think anything will happen on that until there's more uh, um, discussion between all the, sh the stakeholders and the city and everybody. It's there as, as a placeholder, but um, that, I haven't seen anything. That, that's correct. It's a placeholder until we get agreements and further discussion uh, with the shareholders on that project. Right. Is, is the uh, special assessment then down under funding, is, is that just a, a number plugged in relative to the mall? The mall that is correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and then we go on. I, I'm going to just touch base on Mayor, some can I just these. make a, if we're going to go in and negotiate, which is what we hope will happen on that item, aren't we at a loss in regards to having already built it into the budget, if it's even on there? Oh, absolutely not. You know, I mean, this is something that it's not, how do I say this correctly? Even though it, it shows there, 
we needed something to understand what we thought the price was going to be. It's not really there because it's 2018. I don't think it puts us at a disadvantage at all because if they say that they're not going to do X, Y, Z, well, we're not going to do A, B, C. So I don't think we're at, I don't think either one has any kind of leverage on each other. Right. I, a placeholder is just to anticipate if we're going to have a public share in the process. It could be done completely private. They, they could build their own road through there and improve it on, if the city doesn't participate. So it's a work in progress. It is. But I think on, on yours, Rob, where you've got the uh, million overlay and the seal coat, uh, sidewalk curve and gutter and traffic signals, those are pretty stable. But explain to us what, uh, what you had told me on the um, uh, seal coating and crack sealing. Uh, as far as what I, uh, I think as far as where we're at currently in the city, where we've gone through and you've put right. a lot of the streets are, are completed on one of the items, whether it was seal cracking or, or, right. or milling our, overlay. On our chip seal program, we're, we're really doing well with that. We're, we're caught up, basically. And, you know, every year that changes. I mean, when we go to do the south bypass, we're going to burn up a lot of material on that, but we're still a little ways out on that, too. So... I would see us being able to possibly next year back our our uh, seal coating down, maybe do more crack sealing or mill and overlay, uh, get caught up on well, try to catch up on some of that. But uh, but yeah, our crack sealing as you when you drive around town, every street you see in this town has red rock on it. It's been sealed, and you know you you continue to do that as needed. High traffic areas you do more often. So, but we are caught up this year. We're, we're doing pretty good with yeah, that. And, and I know this probably isn't the proper time, and, and Shelly, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I know today I got a, a message from you, and uh, maybe we can throw it under old business later, but about the $49,000 that you're, you're coming up with now that you're under budget, and uh, right. you'd like to see us maybe do some more, some more milling and overlay in, in certain areas to use that. I think he would like the council to address that. Uh, c can we take that in old business, Shelley, today? I would like them to weigh in on that. If, if you would like them is. to. Yeah, so remind me to t take that into old business about the additional 49000 there. Yeah. On the uh, 2021, we're looking at the 14th Avenue, the, the 1.85 million. Um, in, in light of the complaints that we've been getting, and, and that is rough out there, um, any thoughts about moving that up? I mean, that's still five years out uh, from where we are right now. Um, if I'm, I'm going to weigh in on that just a little bit. I think at this point in time, if you take the, uh, the Jensen Avenue reconstruction, take that 750 out of there, I don't think that's something that, frankly, has to be done. And you can use your STIP funds, could you not, Shane, to uh, put them together for two or three years and you would have 14th Avenue completely paid for? Yes, potentially. I mean, we're... Pretty we're in, close. Right. Well, we are still haven't incorporated into our long-term budget yet is that pavement management study, which we've now got all the... Data collected, but no um, feedback has been given to provided to the city yet. So, I would fully expect all of these are placeholders of streets that we know likely would be in the five-year program. We're going to reshuffle that deck <laughs> depending on the results of the pavement management study. So, it may very well show that uh, 14th Avenue should be done first rather than fourth. So. We'll reshuffle all of that as we get that data uh, in hand and, and evaluated. So. Yeah, and I think even with the pavement study, you know, there has to be a traffic study also. So if we know that the traffic is so much higher on one particular road than another. Yeah, it can elevate it. Yeah. Absolutely. See, I, I have a question about the timing yeah, of both the mall reconstruction and the Jensen Avenue Road. I recognize those are placeholders, but just what's your thinking with the, the reconstruction of 212 and how they tie in? Okay, it, th that is uh, something that we're recognizing. Uh, for instance, you see, uh, uh, or we looked at in the 17 budget uh, doing a 
piece of 29th Street out by Walmart because I don't think that that road, well, I know that road wouldn't hold up through the traffic that would be put on it um, during 212 reconstruction. So Jensen Avenue is another one of those that <clears throat> it's kind of on the uh, tipping point. It's do you want to improve it before Highway 212 or do you want to let it get beat up by local traffic and fix it afterwards? So those are the kinds of things that we're evaluating uh, going forward, knowing that traffic is going to reroute itself around the 212 construction projects, and that's those are scheduled for um, 19 and 21 currently. And so uh, also our pro street program is going to recognize potential local detours that aren't official, and we're going to try to steer away from tearing up key intersections or roads that would also uh, further exas yeah. exasperate traffic patterns through town. I, I don't think so the DOT would route traffic over Jensen and through the mall. They, I, I think they, they think won't, they but the local traffic will local find it will, on their yeah, own. But I don't think the DOT will do No, that's that. correct. Yeah. Um, Shane, I got a question for you. On This is back uh, with something we already talked about, the 14th Avenue and up to 25th, it's got uh, from 11th Street to 25th Street. Would, I guess, it to uh, to the point that we've had some issues with that road to the, further to the west, would we want to split that project up maybe? In other words, go to 14th Avenue, or go to 19th, I'm sorry, and then just go from 19th to 11th? Right, and, and actually... Then, and then do the remainder to the east at another time? Yeah, and actually that would get split into potentially three projects you'd have from um, Highway 81 to the roundabout, from the roundabout to 19th, and then maybe 19th to the east. So there is a possibility that even though we describe it as one project here on this sheet of paper, that we split it up into two or three that more manageable chunks uh, at a time, primarily for um, we want to be able to get those projects done in between school seasons. So when May school gets out and we want to be able to have those roads reopened by August when school comes back in because 14th Avenue has carries a great deal of uh, traffic that's related to the school so that's one of the steps that we'll look at when we set up those projects. Shane did you say that the 212 project I know it's going to be in two two segments but that's in 19 and 21 it's not consecutive years? No there's a year So it's between. 19 and 21 so yep. you asked the question would we would we want to build Jensen Avenue before or after that? I would be more inclined to build it after the fact and deal with any maintenance issues while it's occurring so that we have a good road that hasn't been potentially beat up during that time. Yep. So. And that's why these are. this is a placeholder. We may not consider Jensen uh, the year before the project starts, but right now Jensen was in in the five-year plan before I arrived at this job, and so I've just kind of kept it in the five-year plan uh, without a true um, project development yet. Mayor, is the, is the justification for Jensen, was it purely around the Highway 212 project, or was there other no, there's driving other, reasons for that? There's other reasons over there because there's a, a ton of uh, water reasons why we need to get that fixed up. There's storm sewer problems that have really plague that whole area that's that's really the the main reason that uh, we had it in as a placeholder originally since the road came up you know the the, the redoing of highway 212 then it's just kind of made it move a little closer to the top and not to just ramble on about it but you know when you take a look at over there by shopco and then you get over by uh, kxlg water really is is an issue yeah, and in addition to that, the street is starting to show some stress because of that as well. Um, I'm sure Rob's crews are starting to see a little bit more patching pressure there. and <clears throat> But those projects should be done hand in hand. We should improve drainage and then reconstruct the road accordingly. I'd hate to build a new road over a pipe that I'm going to tear out of the ground five years from now. So we'll, we'll try to work those two together. So there should be some input on this new study that would may have some decision. Yeah, from I, that I, I mean, as far as what the what the current state of the road is and how much longer it'll last. I mean, if we're talking 
21 for 212. We were talking if we want to wait, then it's 22 or later. Maybe that won't even stand up that long, and then we got to. Yeah, the 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 traffic impact on Jensen, I would anticipate, would be uh, much reduced on Phase Two of the Highway 212 project because that um, goes further to the or actually Phase One it stops short of it, so. The, the second project the, is the, the one. The first part, 19, is what? 81 West, right? Yep. F between highways 20 and 81, correct. Yeah. I think yeah. you see most of that traffic go down onto the bypass. Yep. You know, that'll, that'll That's be correct. Real, yep. real positive for them there. Yep. And then you'll have the roundabout done down there by that time. Yep. That's 18. Yep. Without looking back in the last year's budget, when did we move 11th all the way into uh, 22? Originally, it was slated for 16, so right. 11th. Right. Well, what we did was I've driven that road, and it looks to me like it, it's not in desperate need of replacement um, as in the next couple of years. But what it was, it's, it's our transition out of having the state handle our STP projects versus us having our own projects timeline now so we can use our STP funds uh, on whatever part of our system that we want and I think that we'll recognize that 10th Avenue and 14th Avenue to the north are probably a little bit higher priorities than this 11th Street is at this time and so we'd like to focus on some different priorities uh, relative to those funds but uh, Again, I, I think we need to s see how our pavement management study pans out. So, and we'll so in other words, those old SIP funds, the way they used to be set up, they kind of determined which roads we did. Right, and 11th Street happened to be... Because of the location well of schools the way, and stuff, fact, I imagine. So. 11th Street, I have completed plans by Helms and Associates sitting on my shelf waiting for us to just fund it and go yeah. forward so yeah, as we even had public meetings on it with, with land right owners, so. right and that was mostly driven by the um, DOT system of how they approach projects and let them so mayor are we gonna there's a, it sounds like there's a lot of things that are up in the air on all of this and what if for tonight's purpose we just leave it as is and between now and the you know, when we have to approve the budget, we'll work to define what appears to be a plan and, and support these yeah. dollars. Yeah, that would be the plan right now is to leave these as is in the placeholders where we're looking at, but uh, with the understanding that there's a lot of discussion to have to come to play on this. So we would prefer to leave them as, as is yeah. tonight. I'll, I'll make comment to that. If you look at the um, total spending line, you can see that all those projects are hovering right around 2 million and then they kind of kick up in 21 22 because we're we don't know how that pavement management study is going to affect our budget but we know it's going to so we're just kind of holding that 2 million for a couple of years and then bumping it up with the anticipation that we're going to have to ramp up our efforts to maintain our street system and again all of that will play out as as that study comes forward and gives us an idea where we're at And I guess as long as we're talking about it, does anybody have any roads, any projects, any issues that you're seeing that aren't listed in this five-year CIP that that you think should be considered? Or, you know, I mean, I guess we're always looking at things that maybe shouldn't be here. Is there anything you think should be here that isn't being looked at or considered at this time? No? All right. You guys are easy to please this evening. All right, we'll move on to page 58, which is storm sewer and flood control. And Shane, if you want to kind of go over that a little bit. Yeah, again, we're just kind of reflecting what our uh, current budgets have been. We've been spending, <clears throat> you know, $300,000 typically for um, our standard stormwater uh system maintenance and, and some slight smaller improvement projects. Um, if we get a 
another funding mechanism identified or some way to um, approach larger projects, then we'll, we'll include those in subsequent five-year plans. But at this point in time, um, I'm just leaving the budget the way we've done it the last several years with the anticipation that uh, that's what money I have to spend. Shane, what will take place with the Highland Boulevard storm sewer project? Well, that phases one and two, uh, I think what I need to do is get storms. The Highland Park is a pivotal piece in our stormwater system. That's really where the storm sewer starts to get of an increased size that handles, because it handles a very large drainage district. But parts of that drainage district don't have any um, feasible storm sewer collection system in it. In other words, it runs for blocks and blocks and blocks until it, make it makes its way to Highland Park and then it gets collected. I think what we need to do is look at that whole drainage basin, extend pieces of storm sewer up in it to intercept that water sooner, get it into a collection system. In other words, right now we're allowing it to flood two or three road crossings and I won't ever guarantee that we can eliminate that, but we can certainly minimize the impacts of that. And then there's a couple neighborhoods up upstream that one in particular, I'll, and I don't want to uh, make it sound like it's the only priority in our system, but Karen Street happens to be a street that has a bowl in the middle of it. And the only drainage out of that whole area is through one pipe between backyards and it takes it through those backyards, but when we get a substantial rain event, that system is inadequate, and it uh, actually floods several driveways in the local area. Yeah, and it doesn't take a major rain event either. Right, it's right, so, so that's the type of event that I'm trying to alleviate with this Highland Park idea, is to maybe get storm sewer that intercepts some of that water on either end of it, and then, then that one pipe can maybe uh, manage the rest so that's that's my idea I guess we'll study it and see if it can come to fruition so that's that's about it Shane we just give a little background of the sump pump drainage improvements okay so sump pump drainage um, is a ongoing issue um, not just in this community but in several like it uh, one concept is to be able to maybe put in some drain tile systems that allow people to dump their sump pump into that and collect it rather than just dumping it out on the street or or into your neighbor's yard so that's one idea i don't know that we'll get there but it's an idea that we thought we'd uh explore here a little as we bit, redo so. streets are we looking at that when we redo a street well in certain areas of town where it's obvious that the frost and the moisture is beating those streets up faster those are going to be the areas that we look at tiling. Then there's other parts of town, <clears throat> for instance, the part I live in in the southwest doesn't frost and water table doesn't seem to impact those streets as, as harshly. So, and, and the other thing ha happens to be you have to have available storm sewer of adequate size and depth to even attempt a tiling project. So that kind of limits you on what you can do, but certainly we're going to look at those high priority areas and see what we can get done. Yeah. Shane, are we, are we working with developers on new developed blocks or areas that part of their plan is a sump pump system that, that is the developer and landowner's responsibility versus the city's responsibility? That's a work in progress as well. Um, I think what we need to do is revisit some of our city standards and, and see once if that's something that we want to impose on people or if we want to ask for voluntary um, participation. I guess I would like to ask for participation first and then, and then maybe move to a more rigid standard if, if that's what's desired. But I think piggybacking onto that, uh, in, in areas where we have water issues, you right. know, uh, coming up on our roads, we are going to put in the, the drain tile, right. you know, where it's needed. I don't see an issue where we wouldn't just say to these folks in a new street, put your sump pump into this thing and hook up and, and yep. get it out of here. Because it just makes the problem bigger and bigger when you put the water out on the yep. street. or Absolutely. And 
just for the record, we've got a couple, two or three projects now where we've put tile in on our own projects, and we're going to use those as examples, and and hopefully uh, shine, that'll shine through and, and lead people to believe in that system. So I, I well, think on that last on, that, uh, on the streets to the north where you did put the tile in last year, what did you see this year as far as breakup on the roads? Was it better, worse, same? What did you see? Sorry. We haven't noticed any uh, any breaking up like we have on 7th Street. We put this down 8th Street and I believe 18th Avenue. And uh, we haven't noticed any of the breaking up like we had before. So, I mean, it, right now it looks like it's probably working. So, in theory, it should work. So, <laughs> It takes a couple of years for the new <laughs> pavement to actually show the stress of the saturated subgrades. But certainly... Eliminating water from the subgrade extends the life of a pro of a project. So, I think that uh, Mike, that last Conrad addition, there was sump drain put in the back of the lots. I don't know if that was at his expense or if the city participated. I don't know that, but that area, I'm pretty sure they put it in there because that's one of the spots that's had sump problems up there. Th there are two uh, privately installed tiles that have been turned over to public use and I've had one new connection here recently but uh, that was not funded by the city. Does anybody else have any questions or comments on the storm sewer and flood control long term? Okay. We'll keep moving. Page 59 starts the sanitary sewer collection system improvements, and again, they're, they're by department. And so I will just let Mike go through them, and if you have any questions, just stop him and ask. Go ahead. Um, starting on page 59, um, this is where we plan proactively to uh, rehabilitate the sanitary public sewers over time. Uh, we've been doing this for, I think, nearly 20 years. And uh, this is a place marker. This $325,000 works for us now because what we're doing each year is we are basically rehabilitating or replacing the worst-case sewers, and we've been doing this for a number of years. Uh, years ago, the number was well over 400000 uh, but the pr you know, prices have come up over time, but also our sewers are in pretty good condition because they don't, they don't deteriorate that rapidly. So this is where um, what we do is we televise the sewers, and then we give a list. In fact, this year I gave engineering, I think, three years of sewers so they can plan uh, in three or four years into the future doing dig projects one year and then non-dig projects where you line a sewer without digging up the street the next year and then work that together with the street department as well. So uh, that number works well for us. And I, I guess that's all I've got to say about that page on page 59. Mike, when you line the sewer, what kind of life extension do you get with that? Oh, it's, you know, almost indefinite. They basically pull a, a resin impregnated sock through that, su through that sewer, and then they cure it in place by boil a boiler, uh, a portable boiler puts hot water in it and melts it and makes a pipe within the pipe. And it's a real nice smooth flow line. Uh, you lose a little bit inside diameter. But uh, while we've been doing that for, oh, more than 15 years, and I, none of them have gone bad. Can you do it again? How many times can you do it? Well, you'd sacrifice more inside diameter, so it'd depend upon the flow. You'd, you'd probably have to, mo if you did another one, you'd, I don't think so, but you could monitor the flow, and if maybe that sewer didn't have that much flow going through it, you could possibly do that, but you'd have to analyze the flow and determine what you'd be losing there. How thick is that liner, Mike, when you put it in there? Oh, I'd say maybe three-eighths of an inch, roughly. Yeah, it's, a, it's very similar in cross-section to a, a new pipe. It's just a way of make, basically making the pipe within the existing pipe. And uh, it in theory, has as much strength as the pipe that you would have dug in by open trench, except that you're not tearing up the street and trenching it. So it is a, because it's such a unique technology in doing so, it, it is expensive per foot, but your cost savings is on the back end with, or on the front end, actually, without tearing up street yeah. and, and rerouting traffic. So, do you, do you run the camera through that again? And once you've done that, do you run a camera through Yes. That actually, it's a three-step process. They, they have to clean the pipe out, 
So they televise it and clean it. Then they go in and put the resin in. Well, actually, and they also, when they televise it, they have to mark where all the active sewer services are. So then they earmark where all those services are. Then they um, put the new pipe in. It's called extruding a pipe. And then they cure it by steam, as Mike sent, said. And then they recamera it afterwards because they have to go in and every little place there's a service line is a dimple in the pipe and they cut that out and let the water come in from those folks that, you know, they, you don't stop using your sewer through this process, but, um, and then it just drains right into the new pipe. And <coughs> how, how long does that take? Because obviously I would think the, the individual lines would have to get blocked for some portion of time while that's being done then. Th that's correct. Usually it uh, takes only several hours to get it to the point where they can recut those open and you and just got a robot goes in there and routes yeah. that out of yep. there cuts them out yep pretty pretty neat technology but it's commonplace nowadays okay uh, well next we'll go then to page 60 which is the uh, wastewater treatment facility itself and um, you want to touch on every item or just the big ones Touch them all? Okay. Uh, the administration building evaluation, this is our uh, wastewater engineers have given us a cost estimate to evaluate our space needs. Um, here, what we've got is we have three supervisors that do not have private offices. They just kind of sit in the room with their staff, and they don't have uh, confidential work areas. And um, also, we don't have a conference room. We do a lot of training. We'll, we'll set together a bunch of folding chairs in the middle of a room and have our training that way. Um, most wastewater facilities have an administration building. Ours is something, it was a, sort of a track home built. I'm thinking about 25 years ago, Lake Area Tech built it, moved it out there. And so it, it's, we've outgrown that. Uh, so we don't have a conference room for training purposes. Uh, we have a small area for lunch room with a refrigerator and a sink, not really much of a, a, a a cafeteria type area and uh, in fact the microwave I think is, is, is 21 years old as my mother donated 21 years ago <laughs> and so and then we don't have a, a shower room and lockers for the staff we do have two small rooms where we have a, a corner stall shower so if somebody was to get sewage on them but a lot of times in this industry people will shower and leave the smell at home well I work before they go home I mean you know so we want to look at that and moving forward I think we should have an administration building um, Pretty much every other wastewater facility you would go to does have one. So we wanted to look at that. Um, the next one, the big item, the $895,300, uh, that's the biosolids. Uh, um, here we're going to take our land application process and go from land applying about 2 million gallons a year to a couple of roll-offs a week that would go to the landfill and be used to help cover the garbage. So what we've got is uh, uh, they evaluated our options and looked at the cost of various um, alternatives here. And uh, right now, uh, land, the problem with the land application, it is cost effective, but it's difficult to sustain. Uh, as you know, we've, we've, a lot of the land out there is being developed. So we rely right now on some city-owned property, but the bulk of our sludge goes on uh, one family farm that's contiguous with us just to the south. And, and just this year, uh, that farmer has now leased all his land out. So we looked at the, the engineers, looked at some options, and the most cost-effective approach for us was to add this screw press process. So instead of 2 million gallons of liquid sludge, we'll have a couple of small roll-offs a week that you, it's wet enough, you can pick it up and squeeze it into a ball, essentially. But so you, it's a great reduce, greatly reduced volume, and then would go to the landfill. And so this, that just includes the uh, construction engineering cost. It includes the equipment cost. And then about five or six years ago, we built a new headwork structure. You might remember that. Okay. Uh, when we built that, we uh, abandoned in place the existing preliminary treatment building. And so this, pro this um, uh, cost includes about $278,000 to take an existing abandoned in place building and then rehabilitating or revamping it, I guess, to uh, accommodate this new process. And then some pump upgrades. Some of the pumping equipment will need to be upgraded to operate at different pressures and so forth. So uh, that's being designed this year. And so this is a pre-design cost estimate, but we'll have the design done in time for the budget cycle next year so that before we get to the 2018 construction year, we will have an um, updated, uh, a, a better, a better uh, budget number based on actual design. So... Um, the $290,000 in 2020, that, that is work that was identified back in our, uh, our 
2010 facility study. Uh, our oldest primary clarifier, number two. Uh, a lot of the structural concrete is cracking, and this year we've had some big pieces fall out. So we've seen this coming, and that's that's a pre-designed number there, but we're going to have to replace some concrete to keep, make that to ensure that tank remains functional. A settling tank is basically you bring the water in, you slow it down, it flows through slowly, and the stuff that will settle out settles out. The stuff that will rise to the surface rises to the surface, and you skim it off the bottom, you skim it off the top, and keep the flow going. And then uh, 2021, the $50,000 there, that is a rate study. I should have looked up, but I believe the last rate study we did was about 2004. And so, you know, right now what we need to do is as we move forward, we want to have a, have a rate study to look at our, what our expenditures are, what's our projected costs and what are our revenues and are we going to be sufficient and take a, a technical look at our, our few, uh, sewer uh, fee structure to make sure it's adequate, it's covering our expenditures, and that we are charging uh, the current rate for the cost of treating the waste to like industrial customers and so forth. Mike, can I ask a question? Because you, you got the same type of thing on the, on page 62 when we're looking at the uh, rate study for the solid waste. But don't we have enough knowledge internally within the administration of the city to to calculate that? You know, wastewater is very technical, when you, and uh, I don't think we have the engineering capability to do that. Uh, or the computer model to do it. Uh, it's and, and you really do want to know what your cost of treating your waste are. You know, we like at the landfill. You know, we've made some adjustments there just based upon market value and some rough projections that I've done. And you can do that in, in the landfill uh, to a certain extent. And I think we'll do it again there before uh, page 62. That's the landfill study. I'd have one there also. But the wastewater, we don't, we don't, we really don't have the expertise or ability to to analyze that. You say the last time we had that down was 2004? I'm guessing on that. I should have looked it up. It's been quite a while. Well, that's a, a lot of time in between rate studies. I mean, not that I want to pay higher utility fees neither, but I think it's a responsible thing to do to, to all the taxpayers to make sure that we're yeah. keeping up with, with costs. So. Yeah. Right now, our, our rates are pretty low, at, relatively speaking, at 2150 So we just want to – we want a, a real um, – the consultants who take a good look at this, the, the, the ones that work in that field that have a computer mm -hmm. model and have done this for other communities and say, okay, Watertown, you're on target or you're going to need an increase here at some point in the future. When, when we wait that long, do we end up taking a chance of having a huge rate increase instead of gradual? Yeah, I would possibly, but in our case was, I think, when we the last big project we did, the $10 million project about five, six years ago, uh, was the last time we increased our rates. And uh, that project came in well below the engineer's estimates, and we didn't incur as much debt service as we thought we were going to. So we know we had a, we've had a, we've had a bit of a cushion mm -hmm. right there now. Yeah. But that's playing out as costs go up, and we have other projects come forward. But you did a, uh, a landfill study yourself, did you yep. not? Yes. Uh, in nine, yep. 2009? Yeah, I plan to do a, another one at the end of next year uh, because we're so far below the market value there, I think we can do that. But at some point, uh, it, it'd be, it, would, it would be to our best interest, I believe, to have a, a professional take a look at this and make sure we're on track. Okay. No, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to chime in, too, on the 50000 bucks for the rate study. You know, and Shelley, don't we have the wherewithal? I mean, if, if we know what our revenues are and we know what our costs are, do we know what our costs are? I would assume we would. Couldn't we establish a rate that way without spending that money? I, I would if I may. I, I just want to I want to touch on, like, the municipal utilities. You know, they, they understand what the cost of their water is, what the distribution of their water is, but yet they do go out and they do a, a rate study on, on cost of their water and, and in fact I think they have two studies out right now mm -hmm. because they feel as though they, they have a very good handle but they kind of want to know what is going on in the rest of the country so I'm not so opposed to doing some type of study I don't know 50,000 seems a little high I, I agree but, with uh, that I mean the, there's different there's actuaries there's CPAs or you know and, and they all specialize kind of like engineers you have mechanical civil and, and they all kind of specialize in, in certain areas. And, and I guess for something like that, I, I can tell you basic costs, you know, revenues, expenditures, but to kind of get into what does it actually cost you to treat a gallon of water, there, there's a lot of numbers, there's, there's a lot of calculations that you're going to do, and, and I don't um, 
feel that 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 is my area of expertise, um, nor do I have the amount of time that I think it would take to sit and do that. Um, there's other things that that would have to go by the wayside. So um, as far as, as my office, I don't feel that we have the expertise to do that. I don't know if that would, that if, en if engineering can say that or anybody in wastewater, but I guess as far as, as finance, I don't feel that I have that expertise. But so. I, Mike, I think it's also important over here <laughs> to understand that don't they bring a lot of industry data to the table, other things to compare it against? Yes. It's not just our numbers they're working with. It's nationwide. Right. And then they, they do that, and they also look at the, uh, the cost of treating our waste. And I did get that number from the um, AECOM. They did our last wastewater uh, evaluation many years ago, and they do that type of work on a regular basis. And so that's kind of the market value for something that we, the kind of study we would have done. So. Well, I want to go back, Mike, to something that you said, because to me it's a fundamental question of, of what our rates are for. Are rates intended to cover our costs and any capital needs that we have? Yes. Or is it to be make sure that we're competitive with the market, meaning if somebody's charging 40, we're at 30, gee, we should raise it? Because those are two different philosophies. Yeah. Yep. And I understand that we need to look at what our – area competitions or whatever yep. regional uh, competition is. But really, our bottom line is, what does it cost us and, and what are our capital needs? And that's what, and that's what our rates should be established at. Yep, and that's what this will determine. Uh, the, again, on the solid waste side, we were we uh, hadn't had any rates, rates increases for about 15 years, you know, and so we kind of took a look at that. I, I really don't have a computer model to generate those costs Technically, and but we we were able to do some adjustments based upon we know that our costs had gone up, and we do know that uh, our rates are well. The neighboring landfills right now are running running about nine dollars a ton higher than what we are. So we took a we did take a look at the surface area economics on that one. That's about all I can do internally myself. But moving forward, at some point, we should have a technical review and know what our these costs are. And, 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 we, it, and we were fortunate, you know, that we were able to put a, a, a purchase offer on some property next to the yes. landfill. And you have to have those. Like yep. Mike, you said, you know, capital projects. You've got to have that cash yeah. available for those things. Yeah, that last increase, we put that aside for uh, land acquisition. And that came in a perfect timely manner. To, it, it, it financed the acquisition that we're and the future acquisitions we're looking at right now. So that, that did work out very well for us, yes. Yeah, Mayor, I, I wasn't saying that we shouldn't be doing it, but that, that's no, no. one of the capital needs yep. that we have and have to plan for. Yes. But beyond what our planning is for. Um, yeah, no, don't misunderstand. Right. I, I, I was agreeing that we have to be able to plan for some of these mm -hmm. capital expenditures. Mike, maybe the question is what Randy said, is that too late, 2021? Or is that still going to be okay? You know, I've thought about moving that ahead a year or two, next go around, next year when we do the budget. And uh, so, yeah, 21 is a ways down the line. I'll probably move it forward to 2019 or something next year. But for right now, that's where I've got it. And uh, I, I did, like I said, I did, uh, I did get that price from the consultant that did our, that did our last study. And so it's a good number. Uh, but, yes, it probably could be moved forward. Well, the only thing, I, you know, when I brought that up, the only thing I'd, I'd hate to do is take everybody's rates and, and all of a sudden somebody look at it and say, yeah, you guys are way behind. You're going the wrong direction. Now all of a sudden we've got to take a rate and take a huge rate increase. You know, it's, yeah. it's easier for everybody to – take smaller increases at yep. a time. So I just don't want to see it get I, I that many years would, out. So I would agree with you, Randy, on that. And I think that's one of the things that we've done in the past. Yeah. The council did. We looked at other other things that we always, you know, hadn't raised any prices on for yep. a long time. And all of a sudden you're jacking them way up at yep. one time. So, no, I think it's it's a good point. Yeah, that's why I just, you know, maybe in the, in the future we can, instead of waiting eight, nine years to do one, I mean, I, I think $50,000 is a great investment. Yeah. You know, I, I think to have the professionals look at it, the people that have the expertise in that field, and not saying that, that you don't work hard in, in that field, but, uh, you yeah, know, I, I think it's a great investment to. I, I think it's appropriate, yes. Uh, with that, if I, I would move forward to page 62. Um, I have a question on page 61. Oh, wait, there's <laughs> nothing there. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, got to have some fun, right? Uh, 
Okay. Um, starting with uh, 2018, that $371,000, that is the landfill build-out stormwater improvements uh, for the north half of the landfill. Uh, right now, the bulk of the waste that we've placed at our landfill has gone below grade. Uh, in cells one and two, we've gone above grade, above ground level with some waste uh, to a certain extent. But we do not have the infrastructure in place to collect and convey the stormwater flows uh, away from the garbage and get it, keep it in the environment as clean stormwater. Um, and when you go above grade, uh, so what we've done is they've, uh, the, the design engineers have ran their model to take a look at our stormwater needs. And ultimately, we're going to have almost as much waste above grade at the landfill as below grade. So there'll be somewhat of a mound there. And so we need to plan ahead right now in cells one and two where we haven't got that stormwater improvements in place. Water pools, stands next to the garbage, and you want to Again, collect that and convey it away from the garbage while it's still clean storm water and get it out of your traffic ways. So um, that number there is for constructing the storm water improvements to accommodate the storm water that's going to come out of the landfill when it's build, built out to its complete entirety. When the north half is filled to its capacity, uh, this, the, the storm water that's going to come off of that, that, that uh, waste is going to be collected and conveyed off to the settling ponds and off the property's clean water via these improvements. And so it's just the north half of the landfill. And uh, we'll be going through the design on that this year, or next year, 2017. And so and then in 2018, we'll be, be, be constructing these improvements on the north half. And then we will be in cell six for a number of years, filling it to grade, so that by the time we come back above grade to place waste above grade again, the stormwater improvements will be constructed to collect and convey that waste. They're not there now. And then the south half of the landfill will be constructed some years down the line with the next cell that we construct. Um, right now, you'll see cell number seven, and here's 2021. I'm, I'm anticipating we'll probably push that back a couple years, depending upon the growth at the landfill. Um, we have been seeing some pretty big increases just the last two years in our, our, our total waste flow per year coming in. and. Um, but uh, so that that's what helped will we'll set that year of construction for us. But right now it's in there 2021 cell number seven is, but it'll likely be pushed back a couple years. And then when we build that cell, that's when we'll need to uh, build the uh, stormwater improvements for the, the south half of the landfill. And then we'll be completely constructed to accommodate the total stormwater flow off the entire site when it's built and filled to grade. And uh, that was at 1,083,000 in 2017. Um, Mike, on, on the the north, the 371 on the north side. I mean, that was not in the plan last year at all. So that is that something that was brought to your attention this past year, or we had been talking about it, and we had our engineers um, when they did cell six. Yes, they did look. They ran the stormwater numbers during cell number six, and um, so we're going to construct we're going to design those imp these improvements next year 2017 and then construct them in 2018 and again it's the north half because that's the only place we've got waste above grade mike can you tell us uh, just a little how it went during our our big rain event out there you know I mean, we got, it kind of ties right into this yeah yeah basically the, the roads out there around the garbage were just about impassable because when the water hits the garbage where's it going to go it's going to go downhill or in those areas where it's flat it just kind of lays there and you've got to get it out of the out of your off your roadways and you need to you need to direct it away from the garbage area so that you, you want the water to shed off your site as clean storm water. You don't want it to soak into the garbage and become polluted uh, leachate, which we do collect and treat, but uh, it has to, for us to treat it, that water goes down through the garbage 30 foot, and it's a very slow process. And so we need to, we need to divert that storm water so it doesn't become leachate. Keep it clean water and get it out of our site, get it out of our traffic ways, and, and get it through the settling ponds and, and get it on down the road as clean storm water. Mike, you talked about some pretty good increases in the landfill usage. Is there anything particular that you attribute that to? Or yeah, um, two thousand and 
uh, 14 to 15, we you know, usually we'll see a, maybe a thousand or two tons more a year. Uh, we we saw a big jump. It was like four or five thousand, and I'm not. It was maybe it was a lot of uh, demolition projects in our area because well, we do have a service area that covers you know multiple counties. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure where it all came from. But it was a significant increase. But one of the things is we do have a lot of the haulers that use our landfill also use the Brookings landfill 48 miles away. Or, and then there's Roberts County to the north about a similar distance. And, and so, uh, you know, one of the things is we are, if you're on the line between Brookings landfill and Watertown landfill, you're going to come to landf landfill in Watertown and save like $9 a ton. Um, but, of course, if you've got a big construction project at SDSU, you're not going to truck that stuff 50 miles either. Um, so it's, we just saw a pretty good increase. I'm not exer sure exactly where it came from, but it's, it's, it was real. It was about, uh, we just, we're just shy of 50,000 uh, ton a year right now. In total? Total, yeah. yeah. And that includes our our garbage pickup. Yes. Yep. That, that's everything. Yeah. Our the the, the curbside collection of, of you know, just garbage only, not recycling, not yard waste in Watertown has just broke eight thousand ton a year. So we're taking in about fifty thousand ton a year, and about eight thousand is coming from our residential uh, customers. The rest would be our industrial and commercial customers, and then the remain all the rest of the service area. So. The, Kind of gives you a perspective on where the residential falls. In 2019, that thirty thousand dollars tier two assessment that is a compliance issue that's required every five years. Uh, all landfills have a an air permit. We have to uh, tier one. We have to use some uh, calculations and estimate the em the emissions of our landfill based upon the amount of waste in place and the age of the landfill. New garbage doesn't make a lot of gas. As it decomposes, it makes more gas. And essentially, tier one, you run a computer model with a, a default concentration to determine those gas flows. And then when that number hits a certain 50 mega, megagrams a year, then you've got to do a tier two assessment. And what this does is every five years, we have to sample our gas and act, determine the actual site-specific concentration of various non-methane organic compounds that our landfill is is emitting and then um, report that so that's every five years that'll be coming up at this point can they make you put a capture system in then mike yeah but no, it would it be like a burn off thing or how do you do that yeah, yeah the most cost effective first would be to capture it and flare it off to destroy it so it doesn't go up in the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas um, our landfill is relatively small so we don't see that happening uh, in the near future for our landfill so we're not required to do that yet um, but uh, yeah. So um, then there's the, a rate study there again in 2020, and again 2020 the design of cell seven, and that would include the south half of the landfill stormwater improvements. But again, that those are, those are placeholders. That's likely going to be get pushed back. But then again, if our waste loads increase, it, it might it might be on track yet. So that's our best estimate right now. And then uh, I guess my last page is page 63, and that's just a place marker. Last couple of years, we rehabilitated. We did some milling and overlaying on the compost a pad that's on the asphalt surface. And, uh, and this number here I know is insufficient, but we're, we're so many years from going forward, but we'll be increasing that number during the budget cycle next year. And uh, every several years, we'll go back and have to... Um, replace that surface to mill it down and overlay it because with the heavy equipment and the trucks turning around on it, the asphalt does begin to break up over time. Does anybody have any questions about landfill? Solid waste? Before we let Mike go? Okay. I am going to, um, since cemetery is part of park and rec, I'm just, I'm going to skip that page for a moment and I'm going to go to the airport, page 65, and then we'll kind of come back to the park and rec. You want to talk just a little bit about your projects? Uh, sure. Sure. So, uh, 
Taxiway Reconstruction Project uh, 2019. Uh, as I stated before, we go to two federal meetings every year and uh, we try and balance this budget. Uh, the federal DOT and the federal FAA uh, go through our region and they send it off to uh, Washington, D.C. Every, uh, the, every two meetings here. They go through uh, the nationwide uh, capital improvement projects and they, they base money on that. That's why we don't know if these projects will actually take place in 2019. We'll find out in July or August of 2018. So uh, these are also just placeholders uh, that we have in place with the, uh, the federal government. So they know uh, kind of where we're at. The, to 2018, there's a lot of big runway projects coming up uh, in, in uh, O'Hare and uh, LAX. So they base ours off of what's going on in the nation uh, the years prior and the years after. So 2019, uh, sorry, uh, the Taxway Reconstruction Project, I think they can fit it in there. Also 2021, uh, we do have a reconstructive public parking and access road. Uh, that will be city funded uh, for capital project. The ramp and reconstruction project is pushed out to 2022. Uh, it bases, it fares really low on the scale for the federal dollars. Uh, there's a lot of other projects that come before ramps. And then below, uh, it shows the federal portion, the state portion, and then our portion as well, which is at 5% currently. Todd, I, I probably, or we probably asked this question of you a couple of weeks ago at our budget hearing, but the 2017, the runway work, that we know the, where the, that the funding is coming through on that? We do not know yet. But we still don't know on that either. Correct. Uh, I have a meeting tomorrow uh, at noon, I believe, with the, uh, the federal FAA, and uh, hopefully we get an answer. But uh, they're definitely hoping by the end of August we have that answer. Todd, I'm going to ask you this question because it's a curiosity question. It always comes up every year, but will we ever be done with constructing and reconstructing our, our runways out there. I mean, I've been on the council for six years, and, and every year or every other is we have projects, or every few it seems like, before I got in. I mean, do we get into a, a, a time frame where we're not reconstructing, or, or is that a kind of a perpetual thing that just happens? 2018, we have nothing. <laughs> that one year. But I, you, you got three out of your five years here, plus you've got 17 possibly, right? Correct. And we've had them in the past. And now, when I say never, I'm not talking like a year is not never. Um, we, we do, never. do we ever get to a point where, you know, I'm barring a, a real problem out there, we're not doing anything for 10 years? Does that ever happen in an airport like ours? It could. I'm not going to say it will, but it could. Uh, for instance, if, you know, we have equipment and, and – with the five percent match uh it's tough to skip a year because we don't know if that funding is going to be there the following year so if we push that off uh, say in in april or may i tell the federal government we don't want anything next year or the next five years uh they're going to say okay uh you may not have funding in six years so right. we don't know and that's why we keep on every year or try to fit something in uh, I, I, for the I, match program. I don't disagree with what you're saying in a way, but I mean, it isn't that we have to uh, be concerned about always the funding, you know, it's just because do we really, I think the point is once we get these big runways done, the point that I believe that is being asked you, do we continually have to find projects in order to get the funding? You know, I, I think, I think right. I'm kind of in the same boat as these guys or the same plane as these guys. I'd like to be done building runways and taxiways also. And I think it seems like what we're doing is not only are we taking the dollars from the feds, but we're, <clears throat> we're, we're always got engineers that are telling us, you know, you need to do this, 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 and this in order to keep those fundings going. So once we get done with runway 1230, and once we get done with the uh, taxiway reconstruction project, uh, the rest of it from there, you know, they're, they're saying runways are good for 30 years. We've seen them go over 60. So for the big projects at the airport, we should be completed in 2019. 
as far as taxiways and runway surfaces, you're, when you're looking at the millions of dollars numbers, after we get uh, the taxiway reconstruction done for Taxiway Bravo uh, and, and tie in a parallel taxiway, that uh, pretty well ends our taxiways and runways should for 30 years plus. So that's where we're at. And the federal government only goes 30 years now. So there will be something in 30 years for the, just the way the, the government's set up. I don't suspect I'll be in the council in 30 years, but <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah, good. But, but as far as to answer your question in short, yes, we will be done with the runways and taxiways, the big number projects uh, by 19. Just for clarity, there'll probably be some mill and overlay type projects to rehabilitate the surface, uh, depending on its roughness. Oh, are they? Okay. Yeah, they're all going on concrete. So as long as they stay smooth, we're good. But when right. they get rough, yeah, something will come down the pike. I think, Todd, we're going to take a break at 7, are we not? But what I would like you to do is, since we're in a council meeting, can you just update us on uh, a little bit about passengers and, and how the new airline is going? Just, just a couple of minutes. Sure. Uh, so last week, uh, Monday, was our first flight out. Uh, a few of you were on the flight. They, uh, they did a very good job all week last week of on time. We did have a few delays in Denver. Uh, nothing to do with Watertown uh, or any of the staffing here. Uh, that's the only delays we've ever had. Uh, and it wasn't to do with pilots or anything. It was more uh, passenger-based and uh, TSA. Uh, yesterday, uh, last night, was our first full flight out of Denver. Uh, we actually had 30 people come into Watertown last night and uh, 20 into Pier. So uh, that was a huge success for us, uh, being a week into flights and having a full 50-seat jet. So uh, give everybody a round of applause for, for uh, getting us this far. You had uh, somewhat of an average. What, what Between 13 and 20 a day. That's great. Todd, when you say delays out in Denver, are we talking... 10, 15, or are we talking an hour or two, or what are we talking? The longest delay we had was a half an hour, and it was due to a maintenance. Uh, a lens cover fell off of the wing, and they had to just to get paperwork uh, filed for that to fly MEL. So. Then, of course, one was Mickey. Yeah, Mickey that was here. the first flight. Yeah, what's the deal with that? I have no comment for that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've talked to numerous people that have used it, since you know, in that short one, one week time, just can, love I it. I can brief you on the uh, the advertising and marketing. Okay. Uh, I have a ton of phone calls, uh, all positive for marketing this and uh, the cheap fares, the uh, the no hassle calling the terminal, uh, booking tickets. If they have an issue, uh, they have people to call, and uh, the people have been very great to help them out. Uh, as far as the. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce and Megan, I will give her uh, a lot of props. She's been doing a great job, uh, as I've said before in the past, and uh, I will say in the future. The website that they helped us design uh, with the Facebook account, we set up a new Facebook for the, uh, for the Watertown Airport, and uh, I believe we're over 15,000 uh, with uh, 60,000 uh, viewed. So she said she has never seen anything take off like this ever before, this quickly. It's nice to see that plane coming in and going again. That's for darn sure. So, I've had quite a few people comment that at that kind of rate, they're going to plan just a weekend in Denver. And the cost of getting there and back is pretty minimal. So, uh, on that note, I had a, a couple call me from Sioux Falls today, and they were price checking out for uh, they do three trips a year, and uh, to Denver and back with their family of six. And uh, they said they're going to for surely use Watertown now that they realize there's no fr uh, it's free parking. And the, uh, as far as the uh, size jet we have uh, is compatible with the family size they have, which we've ran into in the past. <laughs> oh, they had close to nine, so. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll, we'll take about a 15-minute uh, break here and We'll, uh, we'll be back about quarter after seven. Is that okay with everybody? All right. We're going we're gonna to take a little break. 